Are we good? Okay. Hi. Thank you all for joining us in person and online today for this exciting event on democratic deliberation over the governance of artificial intelligence. Something I'm hitting. This event is hosted in partnership with the Center for New Democratic Processes. I'm Valerie Wirtschafter, a fellow at Brookings in Foreign Policy and the AI and Emerging Technology Initiative. For those who are joining us online, I encourage you to submit questions for speakers by emailing events at brookings.edu. We'll also look forward to taking questions from the audience during the panel discussion. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to invite up Syracuse University professor Bao Bao Zhang, who collaborated on C with CNDP on the AI Assembly Project. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at Brookings. Today, we're excited to present to you an overview of the public assembly on high-risk artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, or AI, has become an increasingly powerful technology. It has the potential for both positive and negative impact on society. As we have uh, increasingly read in the news, AI can help advance scientific discovery, improve medical diagnoses, and recognize patterns in complex data. But it also can lead to harms including discrimination, misinformation, and even physical injuries or death. It is crucial that the development and deployment of AI systems align with public values and priorities. Unfortunately, today, key decisions about the future of AI are almost exclusively made behind closed doors by powerful individuals. But what if the general public had a say in how AI systems are developed and deployed? Our research team, uh, you'll meet them today, uh, just did that in a project called the U.S. Public Assembly on High-Risk Artificial Intelligence. Over eight days on Zoom, a diverse group of 40 U.S. residents engaged in rigorous discussions and deliberations, exploring the risks, benefits, and resp responsibilities associated with AI in various domains. These non-expert participants were randomly selected from the U.S. adult population. They came from 20 different states, and they ranged from college students to retirees and represented all aspects of the political political spectrum. These participants listened to eight computer scientists and AI ethicists who presented expert testimony about how AI systems work, the current state of AI regulation, and how AI systems are built using browser and search history, health records, images of faces, and administrative data. After learning from these experts, these participants deliberated about policy recommendations in terms of how to classify AI systems based on risk and who should be held responsible when AI systems cause harm. The recommendations from this public assembly are uh, compiled into a public report. It is now available on the uh, CNDP website. We will share some highlights with you this afternoon, and you will also get to hear from the, some of the participants who uh, came to DC and uh, they'll share with you their experience participating and also their viewpoints about AI and AI governance. Public assemblies, such as the one we just conducted, can play a vital role in shaping the future of AI governance. By including citizens as key stakeholders, we can ensure those who are directly impacted by AI have a voice in the decision-making process. Thank you. going to tag team our report summary. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah Atwood. I'm head of research and engagement at the Center for New Democratic Processes. And I'm Kate Mays. I'm an assistant professor in the, at the University of Vermont. All right. And we have a few slides to show you um, to give you a broad overview of the assembly um, itself. So um, we will kick it off from here. Great. 
Okay, so if you have not already, um, you can go to cndp.us slash AI and get the report there. Um, it is a long report, and it is just scratching the surface of the work that the assembly members have done together, but it is the kind of the first kind of attempt to share some of the results from the assembly itself. So just a quick overview about the project partners and funders. Um, this was really a partnership between my organization, the Center for New Democratic Processes, and Syracuse University. And there were three major funders of this project, the first being Schmidt Futures, which um, Dr. Zhang Baobao um, was funded for. Um, she received an AI 2050 Early Career Fellowship. So that is really what was the impetus to start this assembly work and this collaborative work together. Um, and then CNDP was also um, the recipient of some funding from Rockefeller Brothers Fund to do outreach about our work together. And then um, survey costs and research team support, in addition to the other two funders, were, was provided by C excuse me, CFAR. So um, three important things to emphasize about this public assembly is first that it was established as a nonpartisan project, right? That it was really important as we were doing recruitment and engagement and um, in interacting with different groups of stakeholders that it was nonpartisan in nature. And so we always emphasized, right, that even though this may affect multiple parties over time um, and, you know, different political actors may see themselves as stakeholders, that the project itself was nonpartisan. And we will talk a little bit more about that as we talk about the design. The second is that it was an independent deliberative process. So as you saw that there were multiple funders, but we want to emphasize that the funders, their work really started and stopped with the funding and that all design um, processes and um, research questions were established by us as a team. And then the last thing that I want to emphasize is that, you know, the high risk concept that we started to draw, draw out through our collaborative work together was really, you know, looking at risk and um, potential harms as a socio-technical issue. And so really looking at the nexus of not just technology, but the way that that may impact different actors throughout the AI life cycle, including um, individuals who, and then groups of people, but we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Okay, so there were really three charges with our public assembly. The first being assessing a level of risk. And that was something that the participants talked about over and over again throughout our eight days together, thinking about how risk may change depending on AI systems or how AI systems use bits of discrete data over time. Um, the second was determining accountability and responsibility. And then the final one is determining harm. Um, so when harm may occur, what might that look like and what degree of harm might that be? So to assemble all of these participants, we surveyed 3,000 Americans on their perceptions of AI and risk. Of those 3,000, 2,100 people volunteered to be part of the assembly. Um, and then of those 2,100 people, we used a sortition algorithm to, um, to select 40 participants who would be uh, diverse and representative of the U.S. population on the basis of... Um, where they were from, so both in, in terms of rural versus urban, and then also regions across the United States. And then also our standard demographics that we would want to see um, represented in a national sample, so age, gender, education, employment, race, and ethnicity. In addition, we also wanted to make sure we had a diverse um, group of people from different political parties or affiliated with different political parties, and then also people who had a, like a diverse range of AI knowledge in the sample. We didn't want a sample that was a bunch of experts or people who had no familiarity at all. And then I'll kick it back to Sarah to talk about our assembly content. Great. So I had mentioned earlier that we were really interested in ensuring that this was a nonpartisan process, and that included the content that the assembly members themselves were going to receive and evaluate. So the first thing that we needed to do was convene an oversight panel, and I'll show you who was on the oversight panel in just a moment. Um, but the oversight panel really served as a, mechan a twofold mechanism. The first is that they really assessed the assembly specification. That included the overall project framing as well as the research questions, um, so to ensure that they were... Um, not potentially received in a partisan way, and then to ensure that they were going to be rigorous and durable enough to ensure that six months down the line that the results of the assembly would ideally have impact. Um, and then the final bit that the oversight panel assessed was the learning program. And this was really a material that we captured from the expert witnesses, who you'll also hear about in a moment, um, but to really vet that that material, that, that 
that they were creating that participants were going to be using as learning materials was also nonpartisan, as clear as possible for jargon, et cetera. All right, so here you can see the members of the oversight panel. We tried to convene a diverse group of people who brought um, their own experience, whether that be in industry, um, on policy, deliberative democracy, as well as um, technology, specifically um, AI. So the way that we designed the process, there are really kind of two um, nodes. The first being a set of four introductory um, expert witness presentations in order to ensure that participants received a progressive scaffolding to learn about AI, right? As Kate had said, the, the participants themselves had a diverse ex level of exposure or understanding that they were already exposed to artificial intelligence. And so we really tried to build um, a program here where the participants could learn, you know, have an introduction to AI. What is that? Um, think about how AI systems are built and how they use data, where issues of um, prediction fall in there, where um, the human fits into AI life cycles, um, as well as to uh, how, sorry, how people may or may not have consent or an understanding of consent about how data is put into these systems, as well as a broad um, overview and introduction to ethical, regulatory, and legal frameworks um, that may exist. So the second node of presentations that we really tried to do comes here. And so what we called these were domains. And specifically, we centered around four specific domains that were um, tied to data. The first being a browser or search history. The second being a health record. The third being an image of a face. And the fourth being an administrative record. So here when we talk about um, browser or search history, why did we get specifically you know, tied to a browser or search history? We wanted to show that a browser or search history could be used in a variety of ways and throughout a number of different AI systems. So it might be used for something like delivering content um, or ads or receiving news. It could also be used to generate answers and explanations in response to queries on search engines or recommending systems. And then finally, um, a browser search history could be used to within additional data sets, right, for secondary purposes or to train other AI models. After the participants um, learned about this specific item, right, in this domain, they talked about potential benefits and potential harms when this bit of data is used throughout different AI systems. Um, so they surfaced a diversity of explanations about why someone might feel that it was beneficial being put into an AI system or when, why someone might feel it was potentially harmful. And then we asked them to indicate their level of risk. So this was low, medium, high, or unacceptable risk. And then we layered on top of this what this might look like in a narrow AI system general purpose AI, and then for future or secondary uses within AI systems, okay? So you're going to see that there is a little bit of redundancy here with the deliberations and voting because we brought them through that same process with our second domain, using a health record. So a health record here, we um, asked them to think about a health record being used to determine or guide patient care or treatment, um, generate responses to help, you know, understand a patient's health and care, um, or used within, again, um, other data sets to train additional models or be employed in various sectors and industries. The third was an image of a face. So here, an image of a face could be used for something like unlocking a d device um, or accessing an account. It could also be used to generate um, an image or a video using an individual's likeness. And then also could, again, be used in data sets or to train other models. And our last one was administrative record. So an administrative record um, could be used to determine or guide um, financial products or applications, um, such as housing applications or applications for government services. It could also be used to generate responses about navigating an individual's financial or legal um, benefits or applications. And then finally, again, it could be used for secondary purposes, such as training other models um, or being employed in other sectors that aren't necessarily tied to that individual's administrative record. Okay, Kate. I'm going to share a highlight of some of the results. Um, if anyone's looked at the report yet, it's close to 100 pages. Um, I'm not going to keep you here for 
a full accounting of, of all of all of those findings. Um, but I want to highlight a few a few things from what the participants found. First, relating to accountability, um, primarily participants thought that the deployers or clients of um, AI systems or developers would be primarily accountable um, if an incorrect decision is made by an AI system and, and thus caused harm. Um, and, but we do see some variation depending on, on the use case of the AI. Again, they learned about AI across four different domains and we're, making, we're seeing some nuance in how they were determining um, accountability and, and, and risk considerations. So um, nearly half of participants thought that consumers and users would actually be accountable for any harm caused from an AI system um, in the cases of browser search history or facial recognition, possibly because those technologies are seeming more like an individual use, like someone is searching or using their phone with facial recognition, for example. Um, and then half, nearly half of the participants in the context of administrative records thought that data brokers or the government could actually be held accountable for, for harms caused by an AI system. Um, and then thinking about responsibility in terms of who should determine which parties or actors should be held responsible when harm is done to an individual or group. So who's determining who, um, who should um, hold someone to account for harm. We're seeing primarily that the participants said that um, a government or regulatory body should be, ha should be determining um, a, a responsibility or even a, a new agency or department that was an option um, for this category. And then within the new agency or department, participants were particularly highlighting um, that the legal system or courts would be a, a good a mechanism for, for determining responsibility there. There was less support amongst participants for um, letting developers and or deployers determine who should be held responsible, perhaps in part because they were seeing those folks as primarily the ones responsible for causing the harm in the first place, so they shouldn't be determining um, who should be held account in that, in that case. Um, and then going into the specific um, harms and the extent to which, so in, in this case, this was the number of participants who were, who were marking these, and then here we have, it's not the number of participants, this is a, a sort of average rating of the extent of harm out of 100, to be clear. So, um, so what we're seeing here is that the highest harm that participants were um, seeing was when incorrect decisions were made by an AI system. In particular, um, harm when, if, if an incorrect decision results in violating someone's civil rights. Um, they saw less harm when accurate, uh, technically correct decisions are made by an AI system, even if that may have caused harm to someone. And then finally, um, other types of harms, participants were seeing more harm when um, there is a non-consent, when, when an AI system is non-consensually using someone's likeness or data, um, and then also decisions that cannot be explained. So if a decision is made about someone but it can't be um, explained to that person, participants saw that as, as harmful. Um, less harm for systems that were recommending or providing information in a particular um, filter, and then also, interestingly, um, less harm if an AI system is used without an individual's knowledge. So more emphasis on harm if it can't be explained versus if it's, if it's used. And so those are just the highlights there. Um, in general, the, in, in their responses, I think we're seeing that the participants demonstrated an understanding of the subjective nature of risk and the nuances across the socio-technical context um, of each of these AI uses. Um, and in particular, cared about how these AI systems are built, whose data is used to build them, for what purpose, um, and who benefits from those uses that we're seeing in those responses. And like I said, the report has a lot more detail about the responses, so not even the quantitative data about, we have the quantitative data for how they were rating harms and saying who should be responsible and not. And then we also include qualitative data of participants providing their rationale for each of, each of their answers there. So a lot of rich information for anyone who wants to look deeper into that. Um, for the purposes of time, I'm not going to keep you here for six hours to go through all of that. So instead, I think it'll be more interesting to actually hear from the participants themselves. There are four of them who came from all around the country um, to speak directly about their experiences in the public assembly. So please welcome me and um, or help me welcome them up to the stage. Yeah, thank you.
All right, well. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm guessing when you answered my phone call to serve on the assembly, a stranger's number, you probably weren't expecting that it was going to culminate in this, correct? <laughs> okay, well, thanks for answering the phone. Um, so um, would you all be willing to kick us off by introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about where you come from? Yeah, um, my name's Molly Gaynor. I'm from the Metro Detroit area. I'm in my mid-30s, and I work in early-stage pharmaceutical research and development for my day job. My name is Joy Palmer. I'm from Chicago. I am 30 years old, and I'm an underwriting specialist for insurance. Hi, I'm Toby Rothschild. I'm at the other end of the age spectrum. I'm in my late 70s, and... Uh, I'm a retired lawyer, but still working, uh, doing, working in the area of legal ethics and professional responsibility. Uh, my name's Oculus Trotter. I'm 44. I um, currently live in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm actually from here. Um, but uh, right now, I'm just a grunt. I work in a warehouse. Just simple stuff. I forgot to mention, I'm from the West Coast, from Cal from the Los Angeles area. Uh-oh. We didn't get di regional divisions during the assembly, but maybe today. Just kidding. Um, okay, so um, so we were just you all just met each other just about a month ago, right? And we are about a month away from when the assembly wrapped up. So you know things have been changing. We've talked about this amongst ourselves, but has there been anything that has been sticking with you over the last month or so? You know, based on our work together. For me, it's the fact that there's no real like oversight you know it's pretty much somebody in somebody in the group called it the wild wild west and there's not much oversight right now and that kind of bugs me just based off of what the um the nature of it you know it, it can deal with health records it can deal with you know all types of personal private information that's that's the one thing that stuck out with me I think what I found find interesting now, looking back, is that I used to see a lot of articles about AI. I didn't think much about it before this happened. And with the knowledge that I've gained now, I now see you know, two or three articles every day in both general publications, legal publications, and others. And I start thinking, okay, what's going on with this now? How, how does the information that we learned and the information we provided, how is that going to help to make this a better result? And to tag on that is it's like I, before it was always just something going on in the background and I wasn't really paying attention to what was actually being presented, but having gone through and listening to all of these experts in their fields of AI discuss about it, now I'll hear stuff on the news, pay a little more attention to it to see what's going on, and also kind of roll my eyes sometimes at the broadcasters and comments they make, like, that is not how it works. <laughs> but um, it's just been a really interesting change, being more aware of the situation and a lot of what's not happening. And for me, it's a little bit personal. <laughs> um, I was overwhelmed. That was something that stood out for me because it was a lot of information. Like I said, we had experts come and um, present to us about a lot of different parts of AI. And then immediately after, we'd have to go um, to breakout rooms and deliberate on these issues. And it was a lot of information for me at once because even though it was a two-week stretch, it was about four or five hours a day. Um, but... On the flip side, it helped me on my discipline to sit still and actually have conversations with people. Um, and then something else that came out for me was I noticed that we were all of the same mind. Like the people I had conversations with, which was like almost everybody from the panel, from the assembly was all of the same mind. We, it wasn't really difficult to come to a conclusion when we were deliberating, so... Well, I guess that's a great question. I mean, what was it like for you all to be saying, sure, I'm going to serve on this assembly with 39 other strangers in our current political environment, and then we're going to layer AI on top of it? What was that like for all of you? I'll kick us off by saying it was terrifying. 
Um, you can't even get together with family sometimes nowadays without one uncle screaming at the, another uncle about something happening. So um, doing this with a bunch of strangers was, um, I was a bit anxious and nervous about it at the beginning, but then like it was all, just everyone was so very kind and respectful and Everyone had an opportunity to talk and fully express their opinions and what their thoughts were. And even having just as diverse a group as we did, it was interesting to see some of the harms and benefits that individuals came up with that I never would have thought of in a million years. Um, so it was quite an eye-opening experience. For me, it was, it was really interesting because in my life, I spend most of my time talking to lawyers uh, and other professionals and uh, to have an opportunity to sit down with a group of such varied backgrounds and education and dis geography and everything else uh, and, and as was said, just come to agreements and, and really work collectively and uh, effectively as a group uh, really was, was eye-opening in a lot of ways uh, to the way that I see lots of things now. I thought it was refreshing, um, you know, just like it's been said, everybody comes from a different aspect of life and everyone was able to deliberate this thing without it turning into a war. And anytime, anytime I can see, anytime I can see peace, I'm all for it. Um, my experience was um, similar to, as mentioned, um, I also noticed that we had constructive arguments. So if, you know, different people had different perspectives, it was um, always educational and it was laid out kindly. I noticed that um, a lot of people that we deliberated with were very, very conscious of um, the assembly. Like, of everybody was really conscious of each other. And we were all nice to each other. Even at the end, someone was like, oh, my God, you guys were so nice. Thank you so much. It's, it was a really, really refreshing experience for me. I think that was one of the things that was surprising to me as well, was the level of nervousness that you all started to bring to the process of like, these are complete strangers. I mean, Joy, you touched on it a little bit, but then, I, you know, adding on AI, what was it like for all of you to start getting your heads into this as members of the public and recognizing, okay, we're only 40 people, but broadly representative of the country, what was that like for you when it came to learning about AI? It was very overwhelming, like <laughs> in over our heads. I knew nothing about it at all coming into this. And then after talking to all of the individuals who were like our guest expert presenters, um, I feel much more knowledgeable about it and able to kind of like, you know, I'm paying more attention on the news now when something's on a story about it because I'm more aware of it and how they work and that sort of stuff. Well, I'm, I'm going to sound so stupid. Um, I'm a horror nerd, sci-fi nerd, so when they start talking about AI, you know what I was thinking. <laughs> Terminator, <laughs> Matrix. So I'm so glad that it doesn't work out, that it doesn't work like that. I'm so glad that, you know, you can't feed it that type of malice. <laughs> so, you know, I was glad I was glad about that. And then, you know, it, it's something that's more of a historical thing that, you know, you have to feed, you have to feed the AI, which also starts to beg a few scary thoughts in my head. But still, it's something that can be nipped in the bud with proper AI training. I'd say that, that um, you know, coming in, I knew some about AI. I, you know, I, I, knew, I knew about Siri. I knew about, you know, those kinds of things and, and sort of daily use of it, but didn't really have the depth of understanding what it really is and how it really works. And I still don't, I'm sure, but I know a whole lot more than I did a month ago. Uh, and, and trying to figure out, you know, I know, you know these national polls always take a, a small sample to represent the country, and to the extent that we're supposed to be that, 
uh, trying to figure out, okay, where do we go from here and how do I now use this knowledge to impact that and to say, okay, how do we make the kinds of concerns that we've expressed known to the people who are making the decisions? Yeah, like um, aforementioned, I had some reasonable knowledge of AI before I joined the assembly. I use Siri, I have Alexa home. Actually, fun fact, after the, Alex, after the assembly, I asked Alexa if she was recording my conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and she said no. <laughs> this is real, it happened. Um, I had a reasonable understanding of AI technology, but I was also cautious about it for, at first. But during and after the assembly, I got a substantial knowledge of how it works. And like Ox said, like you can feed it some kind of information. Um, and I came out very confident knowing that even though I don't know what we are going to move forward doing in the future, but at least for now, I know that I shouldn't be paranoid. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of the future, I think we'll end on this question. What would you want? Or what do you want the broader public to know about the work that you did together? I think we, what, what I would say about that is that I want them to know that AI is coming. It's happening, no matter how hard we try to control it. It's, it's happening. And we want to make sure that people recognize the wonderful things it can do for us, but also the risks and the harms that it can cause and find ways to mitigate those harms. Uh, you know, as a lawyer, I noticed before this happened, and, and as recently as yesterday, a uh, case where somebody tried to use an AI to submit a brief that included cases that didn't exist. Um, this happened to be in a case involving Michael Cohen. Uh, and um, you know, so we need to make sure people understand that it can't operate by itself. There have to be people watching it and making sure that the information it's producing is accurate and correct and, and keeping tabs on it. I would like to say that we would like the public to know that they should also be cautious of the information that is out there and not to take everything verbatim. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, like was mentioned, and just taking precautionary measures sometimes would be best for now. Um, the only thing I would really want to be known is that, you know, don't be so scared of it, but still, you know, respect it. Make sure that, you know, it's used to enhance and not replace humanity, um, especially on a, especially in a workforce level. You know, like I said, I'm a grunt. And when, you know, I've seen... I've seen how it can go wrong, and I just would want that. I would just, I would just want someone to make sure that they regulate that very well and train it, train AI to the to the point where you know it it knows what to do and when it's when it's over when it's overstepping its bounds and it needs to get some uh, get a human involved. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me and, and stayed with me over the course of the um, assembly was that the systems are only as good as the data that's used to create them. And if you're not using good or ethical or unbiased data to populate this AI system, it's not going to operate in an ethical or unbiased way. So I think maybe try to do a little more research and get more knowledgeable so that when we get to points where we're voting for stuff, for how we want this to be managed, that you know what you're voting for. Great. Okay, that'll do it. So thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your work on the assembly, and we'll welcome our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
an extra chair to choose from. Thank you all so much. That was really wonderful to hear about. Um, before we dive in, um, I wanted to give each of the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves a little bit quickly, um, maybe share a little background on your role in this project or um, in thinking about this idea of democratic deliberation around governance of AI more broadly. Great. Thanks, Valerie, and thanks, uh, Brookings, for co-hosting this event and bringing us together and providing an opportunity for um, our assembly participants to share their experience. This is really wonderful, and we're really pleased to be here. So thank you for that. And I'm Kyle Bozenko. I'm Executive Director of Center for New Democratic Processes, or CNDP. And in that role, uh, I design and deliver del deliberative projects like this on a whole host of issues. I've been um, lucky enough to do this work for over a decade, and this is nearing my 50th project like this. So um, a number of them have been on information governance, data privacy, and other issues. So I'll go into that further. But this one was really uh, special and unique just because of the nature of the topic and the particular time uh, when we were doing it. Hi, my name is Bao Bao Zhang, and I'm an assistant professor at Syracuse University, where I research and teach AI policy. Um, so last year, during the summer, I had this idea that we should do a uh, deliberative democracy workshop around AI governance. While it has been done in other countries, there hasn't been this national public assembly in the U.S., and I thought, wow, what a great research idea. And I reached out to Kyle and Sarah, uh, you know, with a cold email. And they, I'm so glad that they answered and we put together a grant application and all of this just uh, happened because, you know, I, I really like to thank the research team for making it possible. We've been working really hard. Um, and I haven't even met Sarah in person until today because we were still, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. So we were a team that was working virtually. And I'd like to thank all the participants of the public assembly for answering that phone call to start on this, uh, you know, unexpected but also exciting adventure. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Waters, and I work at a foundation called Democracy Fund. We're just about three blocks away. Uh, we were uninvolved in this project, but uh, in my work at Democracy Fund, I lead our digital democracy portfolio, really animated by two big ideas, one around reparations and a second around rights. And by reparations, we mean race-conscious, equitable investment in our tech and telecom systems. And by rights, we're really looking at civil and human rights in the digital world. So really excited to get a chance to read the report and to hear from uh, the wonderful participants uh, and to be in this conversation. Wonderful. And also, I just want to acknowledge that the Democracy Fund is also a donor to the Brookings Institution. Um, so I guess to start off this panel, um, I think we, it would be great to expand on some of the conversations from the earlier session. So maybe starting with Kyle, I know Baba went a little bit into this, but curious about how the, the project evolved from, from your perspective, how it sort of fit in with some of the work you've previously done, where it diverged based on the topic. Great. And, and um, so, as I mentioned, we've done nearly a dozen projects focusing on um, information governance, data privacy, artificial intelligence, explainability, and, and uh, performance, and a whole host of issues. Primarily, those have taken place with partners and uh, sponsors uh, throughout the UK. Um, and so, this was a really unique opportunity to bring work that we'd done on those issues and bring it to the US in, a, in an exciting way that focused nationally. And I think one of the unique parts, or one of the unique features of um, Baba's approach to this that made it really valuable and exciting was that a lot of those previous projects had focused somewhat narrowly on um, maybe discrete uses of information or data to make decisions or develop regulatory guidance or something along those lines. And this was really about two parts, thinking about how can the public have a clear voice in shaping definitions that will go into that big picture policy and guidance and frameworks that will affect millions and millions of people. So that was one really exciting part. And the other was thinking about this as a way to contribute broadly to broader research um, agendas around how to involve the public meaningfully and technical issues like AI governance going forward. So those two components made it really unique and fascinating and really enjoyable from us and from our perspective and then built uh, effectively on work we'd done previously. That's super interesting. Bao Bao, in terms of this 
broader process. Um, what, did, what surprised you about the, the deliberations? Where did people seem to agree most on issues? Where did you find kind of disagreement? I know um, from the previous speakers, there was quite a bit of agreement. Uh, so I'd just be curious, kind of from the, the scholar lens, having looked at this for quite some time, what was surprising on your end? That's a great question. So like the participants, I was a bit nervous going into this process. Um, I teach American politics at Syracuse University, and one of the big topics that I teach in my class is political polarization. And I was nervous because there's a lot of disagreements uh, amongst uh, people of different parties, different political ideologies in the U.S. on a variety of policy issues. But it turns out, and I'm very happy to report that uh, nearly all the participants found the deliberations to be very civil and very respectful um, when we did an exit survey with them. And, you know, from a qualitative perspective, the ending, uh, the, the last session that we had, it was, it was moving and emotional. Everyone went around and thanked the other participants uh, for shaping the experience. Everyone was thanking each other and also the facilitators. Um, in terms of agreements, one of the things that rose to uh, the, the top of conversations for many of the sessions is that uh, a violation of civil rights and human rights is seen as an egregious harm by nearly all the participants. You've seen that um, presented uh, by Kate. And even when... AI systems are technically correct uh, when making a prediction, but it causes uh, harms to civil rights and human rights. Participants saw that as indeed very harmful. I think where there's more disagreement, um, or certainly it, it's a trickier topic, uh, is around uh, recommendation algorithms uh, based on you know search history. Just because I think the harms are more diffuse, uh, and also because the participants found that consumers are more liable because they're the ones who are putting the um, search questions into Google or putting prompts into uh, ChatGPT where there could be misuse on the part of consumers. Um, and then I, I think also a lot of people mentioned that a recommendation algorithms are a part of daily life, uh, makes it easier for them to find information online. So there was, I think, more kind of conflict in terms of how people thought about uh, the trade-offs. Yeah, that I, I think that that is certainly, um, you're, you're touching, I think, on a lot of the similar debates on the policy side, which we will definitely get into as well. Um, so, Paul, I know um, from your perspective, I'm just curious how this type of report, this type of deliberation might inform some of your thinking in the work that you've been doing um, and sort of what impact this type of democratic deliberation has on um, some of the topics that you're looking at. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it'll be no surprise that coming from an organization called Democracy Fund, we care about what people think and think that these sorts of deliberative processes can really act as a complement to some of the policy expertise and other types of inputs that traditionally go into creating policies. I want to just follow up on something you mentioned on looking at the risk, which I think is sort of in the future risk that was fairly diffuse into whether it was low, medium, high, or unacceptable. But then when you get to the section on harms, it was conclusive that the folks see that the types of activities driven by algorithmic and AI systems are causing real harm. And I think that is a real shift from when I was doing this work maybe five or 10 years ago, looking at platform accountability or even early days Google and Facebook stuff where the word harm was always in air quotes. It was like online harm or offline harm, but I was really encouraged to see that development. Now, maybe I think a question for whoever is interested, all of you, one of you, two of you, whoever, um, thinking about this report, thinking about some of the findings um, from this sort of very curated group of people that are representative, um, how might 
businesses, policymakers um, think about privacy, data governance, um, AI regulation? How can they incorporate some of these findings potentially into um, the products that they are creating or the policies that they are designing? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start with the caveat that CNDP doesn't advocate for particular policy issues in, in any way. So our goal is to bring people together to learn about these issues and develop their own recommendations and are then to kind of communicate those on their behalf to policymakers and others. I think one of the um, elements that stands out to me from this report, building on what Baba and Paul have, have already said, is that... Uh, there should be careful attention, or I think it would be unwise to overlook the extent to which AI systems and the um, potential for transformative impact and positive change that is communicated about these systems shouldn't negate careful attention to concerns about privacy and how these systems are built that, as Paul mentioned, started decades ago, um, and that just because these they may be kind of packaged in different ways, um, participants, really, those concerns rose to the forefront, regardless of what type of system we were asking them to consider. Um, so I think careful attention to that back end kind of privacy component um, is something that shouldn't just be glossed over because there are new types of possible harms or scary things that could be on the horizon because of the way AI systems are emerging and, and, and evolving. Any other thoughts? Yeah, just on data use, I think one of the really cool things that the report did is sort of tease out how some of these types of uh, systems could be used both by sector, so thinking about the difference between search or uh, health records or others, but then also by what types of risk to who. So like, is this a risk for an individual or an organization or societal? And I just really appreciated how I feel like in particular on the individual uses where, as you said, people, especially in the search context, have much more personal use and history with it. Folks want these services. They want the tools. They're just so cool. I want the tools. I love tech. Um, but recognizing that when you use that same data to build up some systems for at a societal level, that there are both real risk and also that the folks doing it should be responsible for the harms that they're causing. Baba, do you have anything? Are you? Yes, and um, it seems like data and privacy are two big themes that uh, the other panelists have surfaced. And this is something that we really try to do in the expert testimonies and how we structure the deliberations by focusing on these data objects, whether it's an image of a face or your search history, um, uh, or your administrative records, those are data that's generated by all of us and then fed into AI systems. So when we were doing the deliberations, I think it became apparent, very apparent early on that this is also a conversation about privacy regulation in addition to thinking about regulation of AI systems. And I think for some of the panelists, when we uh, when they heard about you know GDPR, that was they were like, oh, it's you know it's a thing that the EU has done uh, to protect the privacy of, um, of citizens there. Why don't we have something similar in the U.S.? And so I, I think in the future, this is you know chapter one of uh, hopefully a mini uh, chapter adventure in our. Um, uh, exploration of how to use deliberative democracy to help inform tech policy, that we can go more in depth to look at these particular issues that have surfaced. Yeah, and I think one of the things that stood out to me, actually, and one of the panelists also mentioned it before, is there are types of risks, types of benefits that you know, you can only get from surfacing ideas from the public, from broader perspectives outside of maybe the typical ones that are discussed from people of different backgrounds who interact with these systems in different ways. And so that was really, I think, very um, resonated deeply with me and I, and I hope kind of um, stands out from this report is really just the variety of risks that maybe I, I wouldn't have even thought about that some of the, the deliberations really surfaced too. That was, that was really... Um, valuable for me personally. Can I add something there? I think one other component that I really appreciated 
is so much of the tech debate, especially anything on social media platforms or Section 230, is really boxed in by what do our current laws say and basically trying to find different Rube Goldberg type systems to like get around what they say to do better regulation where everyone recognizes there's challenges. And I really appreciated uh, the detail that this report gives into what do people just sort of tabula rasa think is a harm or a risk without first trying to do a screen for what can you do about it next? Yeah, that's a great point too. Now, of course, um, this was a really special um, project that involved uh, education effort and an advisory board, um, a great group of minds kind of thinking about the process. Um, so now thinking about scale. Um, how might this type of process scale nationally? Is there some possibility to um, bring this toward public education efforts um, to make this type of deliberation viable at scale, potentially? Um, and, you know, if there's kind of questions about cost about that, should that be sort of a state-level thing at the district level um, within schools? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start with that one because it's, um, I think, always at the, the, the heart of how we think about designing and implementing these processes. And from our perspective organizationally, um, our goal is to identify opportunities to um, develop pr projects like this that can demonstrate a clear layer, lane of impact from taking the time and resources necessary to D develop the concept to bring people together and generate the results and actually be able to identify how and when those will make a difference and 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 lead to a particular set of outcomes and I think the the difficulty becomes when thinking about scale is once you begin every le kind of um, level of expansion begins to surface trade-offs, right? So we had 40 participants in this for eight days. Um, the resource constraints were real around that. If we were to want to have to double that, the nature of those participants' interactions with each other over that same period of time would have been very different. So it's worth considering whether or not simply adding more people or adding more days is really the, the right um, approach to thinking about. So from our perspective, we want to aim for how can we apply these processes in the most effective effective targeted manner to actually get at some of the clear issues. Um, and that might not mean that we're involving every single person in these projects, but identifying opportunities to uh, implement them where there can be a clear avenue for adopting the results and, and demonstrating impact. And we're excited to talk about what that might look like in the future, but I'll, I'll stop there for now and hear other thoughts. Um, so I think there's many different types of methodologies for surfacing um, what the public thinks about AI and what they want in terms of AI governance. So in my other uh, line of work, I work as a survey researcher uh, and I have a lot of collaborative projects with the Center for the Governance of AI. And there, you know, we're doing large uh, surveys of the U.S. public, but also um, residents of the uh, European Union and also in China. And we're coming out with a report um, early next year where we're serving thousands of people. So it's a larger sample size. Um, but there, given you know that we are surveying so many respondents, we can't have the same intensive educational experience. There is um, not the rich deliberation that took place uh, because you're constrained to this survey setting. And I can certainly talk about some of the initial results that we have. Um, so I, I think there's, uh, uh, this is a really awesome methodology of running this public assembly, but there's also other methodologies that can be used to uh, scale um, pu the public's understanding of AI. Uh, all right. Well, if I think if there are no other thoughts at this time, and of course we'll take some questions from the audience as well that can be focused more broadly um, on AI governance or on the assembly itself. But maybe I wanted to turn right now a little to that broader conversation around AI governance. Um, 
U.S. Congress is actively debating this kind of comprehensive framework. Um, we saw in the European Union it cleared a major hurdle recently, just last week, um, around their adoption of an AI Act. Um, so maybe starting kind of back in the, the reverse order. Um, so looking forward, Paul, in, in thinking about your work and the things that you all are focusing on, um, w how can we or what can we do to kind of ensure or think about ways to um, make that framework more inclusive, whether it's from sort of thinking about the, the biases built into these systems, thinking about the deliberative component. What are some of the, the strategies to think about um, making the debates around these conversations more representative of the diversity of the public, effectively? Yeah. So I think doing both panels and processes like this is a really great start to that. You know, I used to work for my senator, Senator Casey, and nothing beats calling, visiting, contacting your senator's office and letting them, or congressman, and letting them know how you think or feel about these issues. I think in particular for AI, one of the interesting things is how many people interact with it, both through their phones, tablets, computers, but then also in their line of work because so many of the things we do are supported by what used to be called algorithms and now is sort of generally called artificial intelligence for all sorts of things um, it, that I think will be really helpful and important. And I think that for us and for Democracy Fund, one of the things we're really trying to lean into is how much the traditional laws we have around anti-discrimination in particular, but also public accommodation and some of the other civil rights protections, whether that's on housing, credit, employment, education, all apply. Many of the legal standards around liability and harm apply. So much of the work that we've done already thinks through what this means for the various sectors. And I think it is going to be partly our job in understanding, um, but also part of our legal infrastructure and in courts to begin making those connections of, okay, how, does, how do you think about when this harm happens from a computer? Is that any different than if a person did it? Maybe for you, uh, Kyle. It, what can we, or, or in what ways can we think about del democratic del del Democratic deliberation, <laughs> that's, a, that's tough. Um, helping govern, governments and regulatory body, bodies think about that balance between innovation and risk, because I know that risk was a, a clear question um, in a lot of the AI assembly, and it's a clear question on the minds of policymakers likely around the world thinking about these questions. So how might democratic deliberation help in that process? Yeah, I think... One of the key things that stands out from the work that this group of assembly participants did is actually begin um, to tease out that, A, the public is able to comprehend and understand and have a sophisticated and nuanced understanding of what the different possible benefits of an AI system might be and hold those up and say, yes, I, I like that. I want that in my life. I'm happy to do it. But also can make and, and hold that alongside there could be real ramifications and negative impacts, on, and it might not be on me, but it could be on others. And so holding that kind of dual, um, that dichotomy in place, I think is something that tends to get overlooked in thinking that people may not have, be able to have a sophisticated understanding of the technologies they do, and therefore that the manner by which policy development goes forward needs to be much more blunt and uh, broad. And so I think that's one of the really unique things as well as what Paul mentioned of identifying what types of um, what types of activities or scenarios or situations actually people feel are harmed. So if we think about risk as it's applied, whether it's the EU AI Act or um, through things like risk management frameworks, right, risk is in some ways the uh, calculation between the potential benefit and some harm. Um, but what actually determines what is a harm? I think that kind of 
declarative sense of here are things that people can generally agree upon actually constitute harm and are therefore worth the investment of time, resource, and um, uh, bandwidth to ensure that people are held accountable for them happening, whether it's, as Paul mentioned, online, offline, or wherever that may be um, now and in the future. I think that's where some of the really exciting work that came out of this project and uh, that participants did uh, comes from our perspective. Super. Uh, maybe, Baba, I'd, I'd love to draw you out a little more on some of your other work, your public opinion work that you've talked about a little bit. And I know that you have surveyed sort of machine learning researchers, um, sort of more elite space, but also public opinion. Curious how that differs, um, how those perspectives differ, um, what changes you've seen um, since, because, you know, I, I, there's, like, the before times, which is, like, before ChatGPT, and then the after times, which is, like, after ChatGPT, in my view, and so how that's maybe shifted, you know, in the before period, because I know you've been doing this for quite some time, um, what that shift has looked like in your research as well. Yes, um, thank you for um, mentioning my other line of research, um, using public opinion surveys. So the, I think that one of the major differences between what machine learning researchers think and what the public thinks is they have sort of different definitions of AI. So if you're just to ask sort of a baseline result of the public, a lot of times um, they think AI is something far off in the future. It might seem like, uh, you know, a super intelligence t type of AI or they might get an image of... Terminator, uh, a lot of um, concepts from the popular media, instead of thinking about AI as maybe tools that they, that are uh, AI as embedded in tools that they use in everyday life, whereas uh, when talking to machine learning researchers, when surveying them, they have sort of more technical understanding of AI. They see it as, uh, it is a topic of research and they're also looking forward to the future, but they recognize it as sort of technical tools. Um, so I think getting the public to understand um, what AI systems are already embedded into everyday technologies is really key so that they don't keep thinking it's something that's going to happen in the future, but it's something that's happening now, something that's benefiting them now or potentially harming them now. Um, and in terms of uh, looking at the difference between the before times and the after times, um, what we've seen is um, there's an increased awareness that AI is a technology that needs to be uh, carefully managed. So when my team um, conducted a survey uh, early this year, so after ChatGTP has come out and it's become a big item in the news, across the EU and the US, 91% of respondents said that AI is a technology that requires careful management. And in the US, um, looking at this survey versus a survey that we conducted in 2018, that's a, we saw an eight percentage point increase in agreement with the statement. So I think there's an increasing awareness uh, now that AI is so much in the news that this is an important issue for legislators to tackle. Have, you, have the rest of you experienced sort of the before and after moments in your work as well? Or Yeah, I would say a, a bunch of my work has been around algorithmic transparency, accountability, the way that changes in telecommunications impact democracy in the U.S. Uh, and abroad. If you're like, okay, whatever. Uh, and then uh, for ChatGPT in particular, when that came out, I was like, whoa, have you ever heard of this? Or what do you think? And so that has been both really encouraging to see and uh, kind of challenging because it's like, okay, well, yes, this is very cool, but did you know? I can say it, this has been, been twofold from our perspective. So as I mentioned, we, we've done a number of projects on related issues. Our first project on artificial intelligence engaging the public was in 2019, and that was really on explainability and, and performance in AI systems um, in a wide range of contexts. And there's been a kind of twofold component. So one has been obviously policymaker staff and just general awareness since Chat GPT emerged um, has grown exponentially. Um, and the second part has been within the context of this work and the field in which uh, our organization operates is there's kind of a, a tension emerging that I, I would 
put as a tension between the work that we've attempted to do to say how can the public be involved in shaping AI governance decisions um, now that especially there's increased attention due to the prominence of chat GBT and uh, just general awareness growing. On the other side, looking at AI as a, as a vehicle for the expanded use of these processes and simply saying how do we use AI to do these processes at scale, right? How do we take these AI tools and now do this thing with them? Um, and that is a unique difference, which um, I think presents some unique challenges, particularly due to the reliance of those technologies um, in the incorporation and what might, who might ultimately benefit from the use of those technologies in those circumstances. So I think that's been kind of two parts of a unique um, before and after situation. So maybe now is a good time to pause and take some questions. We've got some hands. I don't know if there's any online. We have Derek in the back with the microphone. So maybe we can start, work our way up this aisle, swing around and come to the back there. If you could say your name and introduce yourself a little, that'd be great too. Yeah, Bob Wyman. Um, I'm curious. I was sort of fascinated by the idea that, as she said, that at the end of the process, anyway, we were, everyone was all of the same mind. Um, given that it was such a large group and an issue like this, can you tell me uh, that consensus at the end of the eight days, uh, did it exist at the beginning, too? And did you do any metrics or measurements of how the consensus grew or changed over time? Um, I'm also curious if you could, uh, corporations have long used f focus groups, often with really unfortunate results. Um, can, you, can you say something about how what you're doing is different from a focus group? But I'd be really interested in, in that, how did you measure or did you measure changing consensus over time on the eight days? Um, so in terms of measuring changes in, in knowledge and attitudes across time, uh, we did conduct a survey in terms of a recruitment survey. We asked the same questions that we asked in the exit survey. And so one, um, I guess this is not exactly sort of attitudes wise, although the, the respondents were sort of more varied in their attitudes in terms of whether AI needs regulation or not. So that that is one divergence like before they went into the process. But one thing that uh, was quite divergent was just the level of understanding of how uh, AI systems work and what constitutes an AI system. Um, we gave them several examples and people self-assess knowledge of how much they know about AI. That was really divergent in the beginning. Uh, whereas towards the end, uh, even though lots of folks say, you know, I'm still not an expert, they now say uh, if some if you were asked to describe AI, how AI works to, uh, you know, just some random person, they're more confident in being able to uh, make that description. And in terms of um, the qualitative um, changes over time, I think in the beginning, uh, in, in deliberations, there was, again, uh, perhaps because of the divergent baseline level of knowledge. We had a lot of folks who say, you know, this is very difficult. This is very hard to understand. The first two days was uh, a lot of information. Um, but I, I think by the time we hit the second week, uh, folks were more confident in saying, you know, I'm beginning to understand this. And, I'm, and folks who didn't speak up necessarily in the beginning were more confident in voicing their perspectives. And I'll, I'll pick up with that and then uh, touch on your second question, and I think they're actually related. And so one of the things that emerged, and, and one of the things to be clear about is we didn't run a consensus process here. Everyone was able to share their thoughts, identify things that they felt like might be considered a benefit or a harm depending on who you are. That didn't necessarily mean they had to agree with that. They registered their own individual opinions after deliberating and hearing from others what they cared about, what they felt, and how they might register that. But I think the key part when it came to the end and what, if I can uh, try to put myself back and, and try to recapture what some of our participants from the assembly were, were communicating, was that people at the end of this, and this is where it transitions to much more and different than a focus group, is people were willing to say, I may not have agreed with everyone 
on what the actual results or the outcomes were. I made, a, made, a, made the exact opposite decision, but I understand enough about why that was made that I will support it as a valid, legitimate rationale and decision that's made on behalf of the group. So if that was to go ahead, I would be willing to support it. And that, in, in one piece, is what I would say separates this type of work. And then you can see underneath, through the reporting, um, how the, and what those rationale might be and get a sense of the various rationale or, or decision-making processes people might bring to those different decisions. And the other thing, just the kind of basic what separates this from a typical focus group is, um, as you heard from participants, this was a very intensive process. Focus group, you come in, you get your coffee, you get your snack, and people say, here's what we're asking you about, tell us. Right there, right then, and that's it, right? And you may go around and share a little bit with your peers. But the notion and the, the, the theory behind and that underlies this is you're literally asked to kind of deconstruct a very technical topic, hear from external experts, engage with them directly, um, even maybe challenge their assumptions uh, as experts in the process, then assess the trade-offs, deliberate with your peers, and I both make your decision and assess and say, here's why I'm making that decision. And in some cases, that why is really, I think actually in some things, what has been the focus of this panel more so than just the votes themselves. And that is what I think really is unique and makes a significant contribution to broader discourse and, and policy conversations. Yavana Turner, Director of AI and Society Project at the Interactivity Foundation. I have a question about assemblies themselves. Um, you already mentioned some of the big questions that we were explored or came up in the discussion, such as what constitutes harm. Could you share some of the additional questions that people explored or arose as important for society to explore going further? Thank you. So, so I'll, I'll try to unpack a little bit. So the, the project, or the, this particular assembly was, was structured in three phases. So first it was level of risk for different sets of AI. Um, the second was, as you saw, who should be accountable when something goes wrong and who should be responsible. And then the determining harm was actually 10 different unique topics that people discuss. And I won't go into significant detail about those. They're in the report, but that in and of itself was kind of taking that one big what is a harm and breaking it down into 10 individual subcomponents so that people could have a more in-depth conversation about each of those. So that, that I'll say is kind of the, the key, the crux of, of what people examined. And those did constitute the research questions. Um, maybe we could start back there and then come over here and here and then here. And I don't know if there's anything from online that's coming in as well, if we want to take a look at that. Hi, thank you so much um, for this amazing discussion. And also thank you to the uh, participants. It was really nice uh, seeing basically the yeah, uh, broader uh, public side of AI. I'm Linda Jake. I am a student at the George Washington University and Hertie School in Berlin. And I am uh, basically on the, um, working on the intersection of public policy and AI regulation. And I was wondering, so data privacy, uh, obviously we, we know that um, an algorithm is only as good as uh, the data it was trained on. So um, maybe to the panel, but also to the participants, um, how would you, uh, or can you say that some parts of the GDPR, for example, such as the right to be forgotten or the right to explanation, which really uh, secures individuals' uh, data rights, would you say that this could be implemented in U.S. policy frameworks? And if so, how and what would be the barriers right now? Thank you. Yeah, I can speak to some of that. Um, so one, I just want to start off because I think that's such an important point that the outputs can only ever be as good as the inputs. And I think in particularly in the U.S. context and uh, in particular in the work that I focus on on civil and human rights online, we already know that whether you're talking about housing or employment or education or credit or policing, or you can go right down the list, that there have been uh, both bad data practices and also 
just discrimination in terms of how all of that data that is now being used to make decisions were created. And I think that the harm, it, to your point, there is certainly like an individual level to this, like what can individuals do to make sure our data that they want to share is part of the system. But I think that the larger challenge is that so much of what these systems uh, have sucked up and taken in are the legacy of discrimination that we have in the United States and that the only thing they can put out is a reflection of that. And so there's been lots of efforts to think about okay, well, what could you do to basically run it through the system anyway and then check it after, or different efforts around, is there a way we can clean up this data in some meaningful way? Um, but I think that core problem is really going to be one that continues to have ramifications. And in particular, in the U.S. context, with so much of what we have so far in terms of, in particular, general AI systems, is we don't even really know the full extent of the data that was used in the first place. So it's very challenging to even check, like to your point, was my individual data part of this larger thing? But then from a societal point, was the data used actually accurate in the ways you'd want for a system making these important decisions? And I would also add, you know, in addition to the GDPR, there's the DSA, the Digital Services Act, uh, now the AI Act. So there is a lot of conversation around these issues and a lot more action um, at the European Union than there has been historically uh, on Capitol Hill. And so, you know, hopefully with AI, um, there are meaningful conversations. There are meaningful conversations that are ongoing right now. Um, but, you know, some of that has been just due to political gridlock. Um, but I think what's important, especially from the assembly kind of viewpoint, is that despite big differences in the people that were part of this process, they often agreed quite a lot. Um, and so hopefully those are certain things that can be pulled into crafting meaningful legislation that you know, gets at some of these real concerns that many, many people have from many different backgrounds. Um, but also kind of put that into a meaningful type of legislation, drawing on some of these conclusions. But there's the political process, of course, and, and we haven't had as much success in terms of social media legislation or data privacy either. Um, yeah. Can I just briefly mention, I, I, we, I think we briefly talked about GDPR in one of our sessions, and I think one of the things that surfaced was while it's while there's a law in the books, what does it look like for, from the perspective of users when you're cooking uh, on the thing to say, I content, consent to cookies, but it's a lot easier to say, I accept than to say, I reject, right? Or if you're requesting that your data be deleted, uh, someone mentioned, if I have to go through a very difficult process, then that's not useful for me if I have to fill out all this paperwork. So another um, dimension of if we're thinking about having... Uh, data privacy laws in the U.S. is really taking into account what everyday people, everyday consumers, uh, how will they interact with the law or how they will interact with uh, technologies that are, uh, you know, compliant with the law. I think we had maybe right here and then we'll go there and then we'll come right here. Hello, thank you so much uh, for your time. This is really fascinating work. My name is Michelle DiMartino. I work at a research consultancy called the Behavioral Insights Team, and I've actually run um, a deliberative forum with uh, Meta in partnership with Meta, controversial. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what, I, I know that there are some trade-offs related to including tech companies or the developers um, that, that have the, I guess, most proximal levers to implementing um, recommendations that come out of public consultation. Um, I, I'm wondering whether or not you considered um, consulting practitioners at, at these big tech companies for um, either expert consultations or bringing them into two groups. Um, uh, and uh, I think it was Kyle, you said uh, something about the pathway to adoptability. I'm, I'm wondering how, um, how you see the pathway to adoptability 
um, ex when you do not bring in um, people that are or partner with um, a company that could potentially implement more quickly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that, and we're familiar with that, uh, that project. Um, and, you know, I think one of the key aspects related to it is one of, there, there are a couple of different considerations. So first is that um, for, for this particular project, we made conscious decisions because of the nature of the project being specifically around um, a research protocol with specific IRB approval through Syracuse and, and contributing to, to, to Babo's ongoing research, that that was the nature. And so we made a, a series of discrete decisions around the involvement of corporate interests specifically. And so um, we actually were in a situation where due to the, the um, safeguards and protocols we'd put into place, one of our advisory board members um, actually ended up in a position where he chose to recuse himself due to his direction. And the, the rationale behind that was in the context of introducing this type of process and involving participants in this process here in the U.S. in a unique way, in a unique moment in time, given potential around kind of uh, the political environment and uh, awareness of AI that we didn't want to have one, any one company overrepresented um, in terms of an industry standpoint. We consulted with industry partners in terms of framing the conversation. Um, we had industry trade representation um, on our oversight panel, um, but, and we also had um, uh, Microsoft Research as one of our pre presenters, but it, our goal was not simply to contribute to tech companies being able to develop, market, or uh, build their products in ways that were in their best interest. This was a public interest project, and that was one of the key places where we had to make a set of decisions around how that was constituted. Thanks. Yeah, right over here. Hi, uh, J.P. Thomas from Voice of the People. We uh, also are a, a deliberative democracy practitioner organization. And my question is around um, one of the first points made by one of the participants was the need for oversight uh, that is not driven by um, the developers of the technology. And were there any, I know this wasn't necessarily the focus of your study, but were there any ideas around oversight that the 40 participants kind of found consensus on or bubbled up from the bottom, whether it be pre-testing or watermarks, or I even saw the new agency get mentioned. And I'd love to hear kind of where you see potential legislative focus uh, coming out of this report. Um, <laughs> I'll start it off, and I don't know if there was, I don't know if there was a additional that, no, this one's coming up. That was that came up from from your interpretations of the results, but um, when it came to the agency component, I think one of the unique aspects was there was interest, and I think to Paul's earlier point, there was strong recognition of existing agencies and departments, regardless of jurisdictional level, to do the job that they're already allowed to do. And I think the key part, if you look at a lot of the rationale related to these, it says if that is not adequate, given the potential new types of harms or other things that may emerge, then we would be in support of maybe something else needs to be developed that's kind of fit for purpose for something new. However, the first place being, how do we use what's already in place to make the most of this? And you can also see that in, in the results and um, participants arguing that or um, s saying that if the legal system, if you can sort of sue because you were harmed and have it go through the court system, they see that also as a uh, remedy. It seems, uh, Bruce Guthrie, it seems to me it's relatively easy to regulate something that's physical, that has known algorithms like a car. Uh, which appears on your street. AI is more ethereal. It's produced and figured out in a billion places around the planet. Can you, can you actually regulate something like this, which is being, I mean, it's, it's actually changing like a virus in each of these little labs, so to speak, because uh, each place is coming up with new little tricks. And you can't really regulate what's being done in your country because it's coming from all over. Can you regulate this or not? 
Yeah. Yes. And really, <laughs> and uh, what I would say is, uh, what we would love to get to a point is where folks are just as comfortable talking about, you know, the windows on your car or peanut butter in the stores as they are different AI products. Because what I love about those examples is I have no clue how a car window works. Like, I just, you press the button and it comes up. I don't know any of the technical stuff. But you know if it's coming up so fast that people are cutting off their fingers, it's probably too fast. And I think in a similar way with artificial intelligence, and in particular its uses, and one of the things I love about the report is getting into is there, are there differences between search or a use of your face or a medical record, and how might you think about the risk and harm attendant to those, is that we can say while that hurt. And I think so much of the opportunity and challenge we have right now is within the platform world, whether that's like um, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, or what have you, there is a law that basically said, or that courts initially interpreted as saying that you couldn't hold the platforms accountable for the harms that happen on their sites. Um, Thankfully, we're seeing courts actually look back at that law called Section 230 and say, is that what it really said? And they're finding, no, it's not. There's all sorts of ways where the platforms contribute directly to the harms and are held accountable. And I think that with AI systems, what we're going to be seeing increasingly is folks saying, wow, that was actually a pretty direct harm. You can measure it. And that's sort of a at the end kind of accountability. And I think what we're also seeing, and there is... Um, a case that Facebook settled against um, a housing organization, basically claiming that Facebook was discriminating in their housing ads and algorithms because as a someone looking to sell a housing unit, you could say, I would like this to go to white men, which is illegal. It's been illegal for a long time, like 60 years now under the Fair Housing Act. And it also found that even when folks didn't actually click on that. Sometimes the algorithm worked in those ways. And the point is that you can actually check, like, how do these systems work? You can have tests, hopefully with a regulator that it's worth its salt. You could actually get into the mechanics of how does the algorithm work. And I'll just say, just to go sort of one step more basic, the choice to have algorithms you can't, or it is a choice to have algorithms you can't understand. Like, that doesn't need to be the case, and I think that as we get a better clear of where there are real risks, we're going to see mandates that actually you need to be able to explain how the system you're doing works. That's awesome. Nods and agreement. Now this one's not working. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Moving back and forth. I took this one from that chair, which is interesting. All right, it's the graveyard of microphones. <laughs> uh, well, we are coming up on time. This was a wonderful session. I thank you all so much that this group traveled from every state, it sounds like. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you all in every audience, virtual and in person, um, for joining us, for your great questions. Um, this was really wonderful. I think, you know, these types of events, we... We hope to have them more at Brookings. I think it's so wonderful to be able to bring in these perspectives, to be able to give different kinds of viewpoints on these really clear issues that you know I might be talking to the same five people all the time about, but to be able to actually hear from, from a diverse viewpoints on these really technical topics, I think is extremely exciting. Um, so keep doing what you all are doing. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Um, so maybe a round of applause for everyone, all panelists. And thank you, thank you for joining us.